and DNC operatives masquerading as journalists. Like a good campaign operation, this comical commentariat coordinates their messaging. Just as the president is hitting his stride on judicial nominations, tax reform, enforcing our rule of law, deregulation, and trade, they play the only card they have, personal attacks. This president is unstable, and he basically acts like a child inside the White House and can't be controlled. We interviewed Trump half a dozen times, maybe a dozen, um, over the course of the year, and he would often tell the same stories over and over again. He's, he both has these issues of mental fitness and then has these actual questions of intellectual capacity. If this were the leader of Germany or China or Brazil, what would we say? We would say these are the messages from a person who is not well. None of this normal, none of this acceptable, none of this frankly stable behavior. Now, the interesting question isn't why they're doing this. It's why aren't Republicans responding to defend this president with the same coordinated and well-orchestrated communication strategy? One recent ray of hope in that regard came before Christmas, on the day all those GOP members of Congress showed up at the White House, and together with the president, they celebrated the passage of tax reform. That image sent a powerful signal of unity and support. And it was just the type of organized, unified front that we need as we kick off the new year with a lot of new challenges. I think we should let the American people see an optimistic, determined, focused GOP and White House working together seamlessly. And I'm talking about on the issues Trump ran on, issues like border enforcement, the wall, trade, reducing the size of government. We do not need a thousand different voices talking at cross purposes on the core goals of the Trump agenda that were so popular that drove him to office. And as for defending against the slippery toads who sit around kvetching while others do the hard work of governing, all I'll say is this, consider the sources and how spectacularly wrong they've been in their supposed area of expertise. Donald Trump will not be the Republican nominee in almost, almost all certainty. The other is that he will not be president. That's a guy who knows he's going to lose. I don't know that he's ever wanted to win, but it's just, it's, it's sad. I thought about eight weeks ago or so that she could not win simply by being not Trump. Turns out, no, not really. Well, he, but that's he, because she, she's that's... just not Trump and she's going to be president of the United States with a fairly significant electoral margin. This is not funny. This is really bad. Just for the record, we're all really nervous. So if people out there feel nervous, we do too. We don't think this is funny. Actually, I think their over the top histrionic episodes of faulty and emotional predictions are absolutely hilarious. This is all they got. Trump's policies are working. They know they're working. The country's working. And they claim Trump is out of touch and disengaged? No, he's not. But maybe it's time to look into the mirror, kids. Now, unlike so many who never saw the Trump juggernaut coming, I did. And I support the conservative populist agenda he ran on. But at the same time, I'll continue to be candid about the pitfalls and problems this administration faces. And I'll continue to point out not just the successes, but the missteps, everybody makes missteps, and missed opportunities as I did last night. Look, no White House staffer should have ever been encouraged to speak with a muckraker like Michael Wolff. How did he have access to the White House? Think about this guy. His book is replete with errors and unsubstantiated rumors, bad or no sourcing, and it contains lines that people may or may not have said Hey, but don't take my word for it. Former Obama auto czar Steve Ratner wrote in a tweet, Bannon may well have said all that stuff, but let's remember that Wolf is an unprincipled writer of fiction. Then Maggie Haberman of the New York Times offered this insight. He creates a narrative that is notionally true, um, the, the conceptually true. The details are often wrong. And I can, I can see several places in the book that are wrong. He gets basic details wrong. He has a history of telling people they're off the record and then disregarding that. Right now. Wait a second. And Wolf is the man and the work that he, 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 he put in this book is what the left has pinned all their hopes and dreams of for taking down Trump? Good luck with that. 
This is nothing but a left-wing la-la land stuff. Wolf is a type of author who traffics in broad generalities and poisonous, unsubstantiated facts. Mr. President, your political instincts are terrific. Remember, spitballs off a battleship. That means you're the battleship. Keep your eye on the prize. The prize is the American people. Wolf's lurid tall tales and embellished quotes are not going to negate the election, or they're not going to stop your progress on behalf of the American people. In fact, Gallup, remember this, reported this week that at the end of December, the president's approval rating was up to its highest level in six months. President Trump has had a really good year, all things considered, and he's poised to have an even better 2018. That means the country's going to have a better year. In fact, the president seems to have all the fire. And the only fury I see is coming from the media who hate to cover it. And that's the angle. And joining me now with reaction from Orlando is Roger Stone, a political consultant and former Trump campaign advisor. Roger, it is great to see you. I compiled that montage for you, my team did, because I know you love to be reminded of all the wit and wisdom and prognostication skills of the commentariat that routinely question the president's mental fitness, his stability, and so forth. Give us a sense of, of what you believe is really going on with someone like a Scarborough who used to be a Republican congressman. Well, the first thing to understand here is that all of this means that the Russian collusion delusion has failed. The Democrats and their handmaidens in the media, having been able to produce no evidence whatsoever of real Russian collusion to assist in the election of Donald Trump, have now switched to Plan B. Plan B is, oh, Donald Trump's crazy. He's mentally unstable. He's nuts. No, not at all. He has his extra sensitivities. So did Harry Truman. So did Theodore Roosevelt. So did Andrew Jackson. In the case of a guy like Joe Scarborough, this is just bitter jealousy. The entire time Joe Scarborough was in the House of Representatives, he told his aides and his successor in Congress that he would someday be president. When Donald Trump was nominated for president, Joe Scarborough thought he should be the nominee. When President Trump chose Vice President Pence for vice president, Joe Scarborough thought he should be vice president. That's hilarious. And now, that, did, that didn't stop Joe uh, and Mika from brown-nosing uh, around Mar-a-Lago. In fact, we now know it was Mika who recommended uh, Dina Habib Powell uh, for the deputy national security director in the Trump administration. But uh, at the same time, uh, they have turned on him out of bitterness. This is the establishment's next narrative. Uh, it, it is a precursor for a 25th Amendment argument against the to president. To remove the president. It's really pathetic. They want, they want him out. And I, I've said from day one, Roger, the first of all, they thought I wasn't going to win. They thought Billy Bush and McCain attacks and Kazir Khan and all that stuff. They kept predicting his political demise. And now they're going with this wolf narrative that bolsters their old narrative that the man is unhinged. I want to play something that he said on the Today Show this morning with Savannah Guth Guthrie. Again, this is Michael Wolf who wrote this lurid book. Let's watch. In the beginning, it was like every 25 or 30 minutes, you would get the same three stories repeated. Now it's um, the same three stories in every 10 minutes. What are you arguing there? I will quote Steve Bannon. He's lost it. Your reaction to that? Bannon, according to this report, said he's lost it. Uh, I've been around the president. I don't, I mean, I, I repeat things. I give speeches. I, I say the same anecdotes. Uh, but r repeating things and like, oh, do people have a stopwatch, Roger, in there? This is just ridiculous. No, uh, look, uh, unfortunately, I wanted to give Steve Bannon the benefit of the doubt, um, particularly given Mr. Wolf's long history as a fabricator uh, and, a, a, and a fictional writer. But unfortunately, I think the facts are in. You might chalk this up to animus if it had happened after Steve Bannon left the White House, but we learned that he was saying these things while he was on the White House payroll, uh, and he owed his loyalty to uh, Donald Trump. The idea that the president didn't want to win, didn't expect to win, I spoke to him throughout the campaign. Never once did he say that he either didn't want to win, and in every conversation, he was confident that he would. 
So uh, I chalk the entire thing up to your typical inside the beltway maelstrom where a political operative who the voters have never heard of and don't care about are trying to whip up a narrative that is their plan B. The Trump uh, presidency is unstable because the president is nuts. Look. In Lyndon Johnson, we had a president who actually conducted White House meetings while sitting on the toilet defecating. But now they're saying Trump is crazy. No, Trump is the same solid citizen he's ever been. Yeah, he has his own style. Yeah, and like he we used all don't. To, yeah. <laughs> but, and he used it to win the greatest upset victory in American Isn't political that it, history. Though, Roger? Roger, they're so embarrassed. They still are so embarrassed and they're so angry that they got it wrong. And those clips will live on forever. I'm going to play those clips or clips like it, like, you know, every week till I don't know how long till till, you know, and maybe we don't hear from these people anymore. But it, we have to remind people of who routinely gets it right and who routinely gets it wrong. Trump on issue after issue has demonstrated that he has more savvy and a greater ability to connect with the average voter than any of these Manhattan, Washington coastal elites combined. And, and they, I think it just drives them batty. I want to uh, read something to you. This is from Tony Blair, uh, Roger, and he disputes a claim in the book. Um, he said as a story about British surveillance during the campaign that apparently is in Wolf's book, he says, the story, as we pointed out, is complete fabrication, literally from the beginning to end. I never had such a conversation in the White House, outside of the White House, with Jared Kushner or with anybody else claiming that the campaign was under British surveillance. So another person, probably not a big fan of the president's maybe, saying the wolf, uh, you know, the wolf is howling at the moon. <laughs> None of this is going to change anything. The Trump core constituency will remain strongly behind the president as long as he continues to keep faith with them on the platform that got him elected. We have a record stock market. We have unemployment at historic lows, a boom in the housing market, a solid conservative on the Supreme Court. Donald Trump's making America great again. And candidly, nobody really cares about what Steve Bannon thinks. Roger Stone, thanks so much. And joining us now on another important part of this story, the president and Steve Bannon have to stop fighting in public. It's just, it's, it's got to stop fanning the flames of this resistance and giving ammo to the Trump critics. Talked about this uh, yesterday, the day before. Let's get into that with my old boss in the Reagan administration, former secretary of education, uh, drug czar, and uh, best-selling author, Bill Bennett. Uh, Bill, it's great to see you as always. I can't believe you're not in the studio with me on a Friday night. Come on, you should you should be here. Uh, but I'll forgive you yeah, for that as long as you give us your great Thank analysis you. of how to manage a crisis like this. So a crisis is an exaggeration, but a PR uh, situation where you have this author digging for dirt. He got all these people to speak to him. And this is in the midst of this great economic news that keeps rolling in for the Trump administration. How should they handle this, Bill? Well, first of all, get back to business. Uh, the president should get back to that graver business, that more serious business. There's that great line from Anthony and Cleopatra, our graver business frowns at this levity, uh, and a lot of it is levity. Uh, Roger reminded us, you reminded us of the good things this president is doing. And whatever his temperament, whatever his tweets, whatever uh, his whims, uh, his record of accomplishment is real and substantial. But let's not fall into the trap of saying this this stuff makes no difference. It does make some difference. It's everywhere. It's in the it's in the vents. It's in the air. It's everywhere. Uh, now, you're right about the approval ratings going up, but uh, you got to keep this stuff under wraps. And the way you keep it under wraps is by sticking to your agenda. The agenda of the left is a given. It's a constant, Laura. They're not going to stop. It's like the rain in Seattle. But what can you do to to prevent it, to blunt it? Who the heck let Michael Wolf into the White House and gave well, the him this kind said of he access? Wasn't, yeah, the president said yesterday in a tweet, right. shortly after I made that point on the show, I think maybe he was watching, maybe he wasn't, but he made this point. He said, look, I never gave him an interview. Uh, he, he wasn't given you know, access, essentially, I'm paraphrasing. But he, he, he was given access. He, he talked to, because I've talked to the right. staffers who right. talked to him. And uh, I understand he was given access. I don't know who greenlit it, but... That was not a smart decision. I don't know why in right. God's green earth you would ever trust right. Michael Wolf to do a book. Ron Kessler's yeah. doing a book, but I'd probably be pretty fair because he's written 
uh, fair books in the past. He was given access to staffers as well. His book's coming out in April. Yeah, to stay with your analogy, the spitballs on the battleship, this is inviting the spitballer with a paintball gun into the captain's quarters. And that's that's not uh, that's not what you want to do. Second, end the fight with Bannon. Cease, desist, over. Start talking about the things that matter. I'm glad for the retreat this weekend at Camp David with the Republican leaders come out and say something. One of the really interesting things is to see how the president's approval is increasing as people are getting word of these real accomplishments. And I think very soon we'll feel the effects of these real accomplishments, particularly on the tax bill. He has done what he said he was going to do. And none of these idiosyncrasies of the president, uh, and some of them are fine, some of them are not, it hamper those very real Why accomplishments. Why sloppy Steve, the, the hashtag sloppy Steve? I mean, this he's okay. not running let, against let, Bannon. It's not a primary, you know, where Bannon's on stage with him. You get a little Marco and, and low energy, you right. know, jab and all that. But sloppy Steve, I mean, I, I, that to me, that's not helpful. Well, scene four, act five, uh, you know, uh, exeunt Steve. That's it. No more Steve talk. Uh, Steve is out. Steve is passed. Uh, he, he's not relevant anymore. Uh, and the president doesn't need to talk about him anymore. So back to business. That's, I think, the key. Uh, but again, uh, the agenda of the left is persistent. It is absolutely uh, determined to take him down, to take him out, to call him a nut, to call him a lunatic, to call him a child, to call him a baby. They're going to overplay this because the people are going to see real results as compared to this yeah, kind of rhetoric. You know, I think uh, we have a, a clip of a uh, bunch of Democrats going nuts on this. Let's watch. Good, good. It doesn't take a mental health professional to know that the president has said very disturbing things. He is not fit to be president. What has been revealed in this book isn't surprising to people. The president's uh, erratic uh, behavior about, um, in many respects, his unfitness for the responsibilities of that job. We need every tool in the constitutional toolkit out on the table to get us through this very difficult period in American history. So there you had it. It's uh, the media saying similar things to the Democratic <laughs> Congress, but now they're bringing in psychiatrists. Well, if you had to diagnose yeah. Trump from afar, would you diagnose him as X, Y, or Z? This is how low they have gone. He has his finger on the nuclear button and he's going to blow the world to shreds. It's like Ronnie Reagan, right. uh, Bill, back right. in the Reagan and administration all over again. Remember? You betcha I do. Uh, diagnosing at a distance, not supposed to be doing that, doctors. But what I can't stand is the insufferable moral superiority, the self-superiority, this moral narcissism. I say that as the author of the Book of Virtues, you know, I'm a striving, erring creature myself. But they are so sure and so confident. Of course, they're not. They're throwing everything out there they can and hoping that it sticks. So, Bill, you know, this yeah. is a fight. This is a fight like we haven't had in a long time. And we no, got to stay in it and stay at it. Yeah, and stay and stay positive and keep moving forward. I'm going to say it again. Spitballs off a battleship. I love it. Don't let the paintball guy come into the <laughs> come into the hall. Into uh, the Bill. captain's quarters. Right. Exactly. Right. Forget about it. I have to, have to deliver filet mignon. That's all I, all you want them to do. Bill now, always... now I'm writing lines for you. Writing okay, lines well, for you. You wrote lines for me. Keep, keep them coming. That's right. In the old speech writing days, Bill Bennett. <laughs> Uh, from North Carolina. You, and by the way, Bill, while the media has been obsessed with Trump, you know who had a really bad week? Hillary Clinton in the deep state. We'll tell you why. And later, the debut of a brand new reoccurring segment that sticks a fork and all the right people. Stay for that. I know the left wants us to focus on that Michael Wolf book and all its bombshells, those critical pieces of information that the president chows down on burgers and he asks for three TVs in his bedroom. Ooh, but there's real news to cover. And here it is. The Justice Department began a new investigation into classified material on Hillary Clinton's private email server when she was secretary of state. The FBI launched a new investigation into whether the Clinton Foundation ran a pay-to-play operation. That's a separate investigation. And now Senators Grassley and Graham, it's a trifecta, just referred Christopher Steele, the author of that phony Trump dossier, to the Justice Department for perhaps criminal investigation. Joining us to discuss those real developments from Capitol Hill, Congressman Jim Jordan, and he's not wearing a jacket. You promised that you were going to wear a jacket 
on the show I, the next time I you forgot. came. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm buying you a new blazer. For, I'm buying one for you. New yeah, Year's particularly Day. the start of the new year, I should have done that. <laughs> Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. I'm just, I love teasing you. You know that. Um, and of course, uh, of the House Oversight and Judiciary Committees. Uh, Congressman, let's talk about whether this is a real critical turn for the attorney yes. general. Um, you, yes. you, you came out with an op-ed that you wrote right. a few days ago. Uh, we'll get into that. But this is now a new development. It's not Fusion GPS. This goes right to the heart of the Clinton corruption yeah. at the State Department and at the email server. Which of those investigations is more important in your view? Yeah. They're all important, and they should have happened a long time ago. I think this is a this is a turning point, and I think a lot of credit goes to Chairman Nunes and the and the push that he's been having, and frankly, a bunch of us. I mean, we've we've talked about uh, uh, Senator Sen or Attorney General Sessions doing his job over there. I think we're maybe turning a, a corner here, as you point out, getting to the bottom of these important questions that the American people want answers to. So, do you now take back what you wrote in your editorial with Congressman Meadows that no, it look, might be good for Jeff Sessions to move on, given the fact that these leaks keep happening? Uh, in the Mueller investigation, we've seen more yeah. leaks happen over the last few weeks. Critical pieces of information coming out of that investigation. No, yeah. there's no, there's no sense that it's a Trump person leaking that stuff. That's got to be coming out of DOJ. Yeah, right, exactly. I think there are four, four key things. Stop the leaks, give us the documents, answer our questions. I asked Senator, our Congressman, <laughs> Attorney General Sessions, I asked him in the, in the witness, uh, when he was witness in the Judiciary Committee, I asked him, I said, look, did you pay Christopher Steele? Did you pay the author of the dossier, the person that Senator Grassley and, and, and Senator Graham are talking about today? Did the FBI pay him at the same time the Clinton campaign was paying him? And we need a second special counsel. Even Lindsey Graham and a host of members are calling for that second special counsel to examine all this. So those are the four key points. If there's movement on those, fine. That's what I hope happens. But if there's not, then there should be a new attorney general. That's what we said in our piece. I like Jeff Sessions. I want him to do his job. And if he's going to do that, and as you point out, I think we, we turned a corner uh, this week on the fact that they're telling us they're not going to give us the documents and access to important witnesses. How how significant is Lindsey Graham, of course, a former judge advocate general, a uh, lawyer for the JAG Corps, uh, and Grassley coming out and asking the Justice Department to look into the possibility of a criminal investigation into, yeah. mis into Mr. Steele, who's the one who helped generate and shepherd through right. this fake dossier that you know, could very well have led to the uh, opening of this entire investigation and well. the FISA warrant and all the rest. Exactly right. I, I want to see what that what they wrote. Uh, I, I, I want to see what, what comes of this. But I think it's important. The fact that they're actually wanting to maybe have a criminal referral for this guy who was the, the author of the dossier, who was being paid by the Clinton campaign. It's reported that he was being reimbursed by the FBI at the same time. We don't know if that's true, but if it is, I think that's problematic, certainly. So I think this is this is critical as are a host of questions. I mean, think about it. What, why, why did the Justice Department release some of the text messages. Why did they release any at all? Normally they say ongoing investigation. We're not going to release any information, make any information public. But they gave us 375 of these Peter Strzok, Lisa and Page text messages. Why only 375? Where's the other 96 percent? Where's the well, other 96 percent? The others, though, the others, though, Congressman, might be related to, you know, whether having a romantic dinner. I mean, I, I guess we don't need to know about that, right? Because it was his paramour at the time. How, why did they release any of them? And, and if so, why did they pick the 375? When do we see mm -hmm. the others? Why did Lisa Page leave the Mueller team two weeks before the FBI knew about the text messages, knew what was contained in these? That's interesting, I think. So there's a host of questions Con we need to get the answers to. Uh, uh, that's what I want to accomplish. The Clinton Foundation spokesperson came out, Nick Merrill, uh, communications director, came out and said, let's call this what it is, a sham. This is a philanthropy does, that does life-changing work which Republicans have tried to turn into a political football. And at the same time, we had Philippe Reynas, who is a former uh, aide to Hillary Clinton at the State Department. And we had him on last yeah. night. He basically said the same thing. He said, Republicans are trying to distract from their own troubles by ginning up investigations into old, settled matters. You know, Laura, I wish there was a one tenth of the intensity to get answers to all the things we have learned in the last eight weeks relative to Clinton and how the investigation was handled and, and, and the Russian issue. One tenth of the intensity on all of those as there is on the, the, the Mueller special counsel investigation from the left, because to date, not one bit of evidence shows the Trump campaign coordinated with Russians to influence the election. But we know, just as sure as you and I are talking, 
We know today that the Clinton campaign paid the law firm, who paid Fusion, who paid Chris Steele, who paid Russians to do what? Influence the election. And we know that Peter Strzok, the guy who ran the Clinton investigation, interviewed her, interviewed Mills, interviewed Abedin, changed the exoneration letter, had these text messages with Lisa Page where he said, we need an insurance policy to make sure that we don't run the risk that Donald Trump gets yeah. elected by the American people. So I just wish one-tenth of the intensity they have for, for special counsel Mueller's investigation, one-tenth of that was applied to getting the answers to all the questions that arise from that fact pattern. Well, Adam Schiff, Congressman Adam Schiff, a lot of people think is le leaking information out of those closed door sessions of the committee. He says that you all are blocking his ability to bring oh back witnesses like Don Jr. He wants to bring back and others to get to the bottom of, uh, I guess, a potential obstruction uh, you know what? Charge against the president, even though the president really can't be charged. With you know what, Laura? I would be happy. They can they can interview all the witnesses they want, however many times they want, whatever sequence they want. If we would just be able to interview Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, Bruce Orr, his wife Nellie Orr, Jim Baker. Why was Jim Baker, the general counsel of the FBI, reassigned just two weeks ago? Why did that happen? I want to know the answer to that. I want to I want to get the documents so I can yeah, well, prepare. Then I want charge, to depose so, them. Then yes. I want to depose them. And then I want to bring them on the witness yeah. stand under oath, answering questions in front of the American people. It seems like contempt of Congress has a, the threat of contempt of Congress has started to get some balls rolling over yeah, there. So, exactly. So that's exactly. good work. Congressman, thank you so much for joining us. And up you next, by the way, the president may keep his biggest campaign promise of all. And Hollywood is a problem. How to celebrate what is its worst year ever at the Golden Globes. I can hardly wait. Malkin weighs in on both. Stay there. We've been imploring President Trump all week to stick to his guns and make sure that he gets that border wall built, all of it, as part of any DACA deal, which I'm not wild about in the first place. Now the president is asking Congress for $18 billion for new and replacement barriers and other deterrents that would cover nearly half of the southern border. But is that really enough to fulfill his campaign promise? Is that the wall that everybody thought about? For answers, we turn to conservative columnist Michelle Malkin, who's in Colorado Springs. She joins us now. Michelle, build the wall and make Mexico pay for it. Now, we're seeing some prototypes of the wall, and some of them look really imposing and great. But when I start hearing about sensors and towers and roads, I mean, towers and roads you do need, but sensors and see-through walls and virtual walls, uh, that doesn't thrill me, I have to say. What's your thought? Well, the $18 billion request is a good, solid down payment on Donald Trump's premier and marquee promise to secure our borders and build that wall. I applaud that. It comes on top of another $2 billion that was requested earlier last year to add another uh, enforcement on uh, parts of the Texas border and San Diego that would cover another 60 miles. Um, but I think that one of the key principles here that has to be repeated over and over again, and I'm hearing it from ranchers, from grassroots immigration enforcement activists, from the angel moms and dads uh, that were promised by Donald Trump that this would be his first and most important priority, is that we need to fix our borders, not DACA. And I think we have uh, some prepositional problems here, Laura, yeah. because I do not want to hear the phrase, uh, well, we will uh, have DACA, but first, you know, before, you know, the, the, as, as if, you know, something is contingent on something else. Yeah. I mean, it should be the wall, period, and the wall alone. The wall must stand alone. Yeah, let's, let's talk about what the DACA recipients are all about. I mean, a lot of them are in school and working now. But there is other information that I think a lot of Americans aren't aware of. You've written about it extensively. 2,139 of the DACA recipients have had their status revoked for crime. This is between 2013 and 2017. Fewer than 900 currently serve in the military, U.S. military. That's 0.1% in the U.S. military, as if we couldn't make that up, Michelle, with other recruits right. who are American citizens. They always say they're serving in our military, like 600,000 are serving in the military. But these are the, these are the verbal tricks that the amnesty crowd always uses to put the interests of foreigners who are here illegally 
ahead of American citizens. It's supposed to be Americans first, not foreigners first, not illegal immigrants first, but Americans first. Yeah, that's right. And there's nothing nativist or racist or ethnically bigoted about putting our American sovereignty first. And I'll tell you, the most passionate people who say this are people who were beneficiaries of a legal and orderly system that put a premium on immigrants who are coming to this country, Absolutely. like my parents, who put a commitment to assimilation. And that is the deal that has gone, gotten uh, completely thrown under the bus. Why is it that we have so many politicians on both sides of the aisle, Laura, and you and I have talked and reported tirelessly on this for upwards of two decades now. Why is it that we have politicians who think it is such an urgent priority to put 800,000 right. illegal aliens and their families Michelle, above Michelle. all of these working class Americans and also law abiding naturalized right. citizens? And, and, we got, and we all know they're all gonna just come in and vote Republican, right? They're a bunch of Adam Smith <laughs> Republicans, come on. I, but right. I, I mean, they're, they're just dog-eared copies of the Federalist Papers on their bedside table. I mean, come on. This is it's a, it's a demographic time bomb for the GOP unless this thing is done right. And uh, I'm, I'm concerned, frankly, and I, I hope the president, he, I know he watches. He has to stick to his guns. You weren't, you weren't elected to give amnesty to 800,000 people. I agree with you on that, although if we can end chain migration... That might be a really great thing. But I also want to get your take on this, Michelle, because I know you got your popcorn ready. You got your pajamas, the foot pajamas already. You're ready for the Golden Globes <laughs> on Sunday. I'd love to sit with you, by the way, and watch the Golden Globes. That would be a riot. I'm going to fly out there and do that with you. Uh, and the previews, <laughs> the previews in the media are a bit odd. Listen to this. Reuters asks, party or not, Golden Globes proves test for Hollywood sex scandal. And NPR writes, are harassment scandals overshadowing Hollywood's award season? So I have to ask you this, Michelle. Are we actually supposed to feel sorry for these folks who have oversexualized themselves and the culture for years? Look at those. Uh, that's plunging all the way to the ground, those necklines. And I wonder why people are uh, people give them a couple of couple of glances. <laughs> what, what, we're supposed to feel sorry for them because what their their goodie bag experience is not going to be as fulsome this year. Yeah, that's right. Here are my tears shedding, and, and let me play the world's <laughs> smallest violin for Hollyweird. No, you know, I, I just don't understand how uh, Hollywood sustains. What are there, two dozen of these award shows, these narcissism fests? There's probably award shows for the award shows now. Uh, and, and then on top of that, you've got the New York Times running ads to remind Hollywood of all of the uh, wonderful reporting that oh, it's yeah, done on all of have that, predators we have that and whitewashing ad. yeah we have that stupid ad it's like he said she said she said she said she well as if she she could never exaggerate or be an embittered former employee who was in a consensual relationship who just got mad i mean the women if they accuse they're always right and men are always the horrible awful rotten people that they are i mean that's what we have to know especially if it's oh there it is isn't that a compelling ad um, I want to play this for you, Michelle, real quick, get your response. This is an NPR interview today, uh, I think one of the, with one of the organizers of the uh, Golden Globes. Let's watch. How do you expect the story of sexual harassment and assault to figure into nominations this year? Well, I, I'm going to take it back to Donald Trump. You know, I think a lot of the fuel for this movement is the fact that he has been accused of misconduct and he's still sitting there in the White House. So it's not Kevin Spacey, Harvey Weinstein. Uh, uh, CK, whatever his name was, that the comedian, all these freaks. Right. It's not about let them. It, yeah, it's right. about Trump. And, and let alone the half dozen people at NPR on which this woman was appearing who have also been suspended or fired because of sexual harassment. At some point, it has to be the responsibility of all of these liberal women, uh, whether it's Meryl Streep or all oh, of the liberal co-hosts at NPR and PBS, uh, who are responsible for allowing all of these predators and perverts uh, to, to walk among them and work among them <laughs> while they were pointing the fingers at Republicans and conservatives. No, the best, the mirror, we're, dears. Michelle, we're almost out of time, but the absolute best anecdote is when Meryl Streep trying to shift blame away from her own, you know, com complicity with the uh, Weinstein, is that she said that Dustin Hoffman slapped her too hard in 1979 in Kramer versus Kramer in a scene. That's 
how pathetic this has, <laughs> has become. By the way, I love that movie. It's a great movie. Hey, Michelle, I wish I could watch the Golden Globes with you this weekend, but we got to do one of those things together and film it because our commentary throughout would be absolutely hysterical. You have a great live stream. <laughs> exactly. We're doing it. There's no doubt about it. Michelle, have a great have a great weekend. And by the way, the New York Times latest bombshell on Trump may just be another big fat dud. And one of the best legal minds around will tell us why next. Now that the Russia collusion story is falling apart, the New York Times is pushing even harder on accusations that President Trump obstructed justice by firing former FBI Director James Comey. CNN and MSNBC were obsessed with this Times latest bombshell that Trump asked the White House counsel, Don McGahn, to try to convince Attorney General Sessions to not recuse himself from the Russia investigation. But what did that story actually tell us? Here with answers, George Washington University law professor and constitutional expert, an old friend, Jonathan Turley. First time here on the show. Great to see Congratulations you. Congratulations on the show, Absolutely. belatedly. It's great to see you. So uh, what about this Times report that Trump didn't want Sessions to recuse himself? I wouldn't wanted Sessions to recuse himself, him either, if I were president. Well, no president does. Actually, I was one of the early voices saying that Sessions should recuse himself. And I actually think it was better for the president for him to recuse himself. I don't, but go ahead. Because if Sessions hadn't, no matter what happened in the investigation, people would be questioning its outcome. I don't see a crime here. I never have. Yeah. And I think that the best thing for the president is to remove all of these shadows and to say, go ahead, investigate it. Let's get to the conclusion. Now, McGahn's involvement is problematic. White House counsel urged by the president, talk to Sessions. Tell him right. there's no need to recuse himself. Well, it, it's timing is everything here. If, if the report is correct and, and McGahn was aware that Sessions had decided to recuse himself, then it's pretty problematic for him to go and try to convince him not to. Once you have someone who has made that conflicts determination, if it was the, his view that he was considering but it... But is that McGahn obstructing justice or the no, president? No, I don't think this no is one, obstructing. This is not obstructing justice. But it's... These Why? are bright because lines. Because the president... You, you don't think the president can obstruct justice, do you? No, I do think the president can. You do. Can, so you disagree with, uh, with Dershowitz on this. I try not to, but I do think that the president can obstruct justice. Okay, let's yeah. watch what he said uh, just a few days ago. I think if Congress ever to, were to charge him with obstruction of justice for exercising his constitutional authority under Article 2, we'd have a constitutional crisis. It's a month ago, but a few days a month, you know, we're in a blur. Holidays, <laughs> holiday, food coma. So uh, it would be a constitutional crisis. I'm afraid I have to disagree with Alan on this. I, I, there's lots of things that people can do constitutionally or legally, but be, they can do them for the wrong reason, for unlawful reasons. And so I think that a president could be charged with obstruction of justice. Now, whether it be a strong case... Well, but he's, be... in ch he's in charge of the law enforcement of the whole country, so isn't it in his discretion, whether to fire Comey, not fire Comey, whether it's to, to encourage someone, well, you don't need to recuse yourself or not recuse yourself, himself. He's the head of the entire branch of government. He yeah. can fire any of these people, even as, you know, his White House counsel's office concluded that, even though they didn't tell him that, because they were worried he was going to fire Comey. <laughs> well, I think that's what makes this a difficult case to make, but I don't think there's any bar on making the case. There's lots of people that have discretionary yeah. authority that use it inappropriately, use it illegally. Can you be charged for that? Yes. Yeah, but they're but, not the president and the titular head of the entire executive right. branch. But that's think, the difference here. But I think that the, the problem here is not that the President Trump couldn't be charged with it. The problem is that President Trump had ample reason to fire Comey. His timing was pretty bad, but he had ample reason to do so. And in fact, if you look at the record, he actually states those reasons. Now, it got all messed up with a few Apparently, he comments. said initially, Russia wasn't mentioned in the letter firing Comey, but then... And this right. report says it was in the letter. Is that well, problematic? Well, well, Comey, well, Comey himself said that in this meeting, that Trump said that he agreed, that Comey agreed with him that the Russian investigation should reach a conclusion. And that doesn't sound like a guy trying to obstruct it. Now, he did say, I'd like yeah. you to, to forget about Flynn. He's been punished enough. But I don't see a case for obstruction. But can a case theoretically be made against a president? I don't see the constitutional bar to that. Jonathan Turley, you must come back. And have a great weekend. <laughs> Always good to see you. And when we come back, are the experts really smarter than you are? A new segment coming up. Megan's. Okay, you ready? A new segment 
where we'll regularly feature the good, the bad, and the truly ugly from those geniuses who are paid to know more about all the complicated stuff than the rest of you. You know, they call them the experts. Tonight, sowing fear and pessimism about President Donald Trump's approach to fiscal matters. On the night Trump was elected, Nobel Prize winning economist and New York Times columnist Paul Krugman wrote, it really does look like President Donald Trump and the markets are plunging. If the question is when markets will recover, a first pass answer is never. Krugman also said, we are very probably looking at a global recession with no end in sight. Andrew Ross Sorkin of the Times predicted the stock market would, quote, fall precipitously. Just weeks after the president took office, Matthew Barkoff of Carlson Capital in Dallas, he was out there warning Trump might trigger, quote, a global depression. The Bank of England and several prominent economists also issued their own dire warnings. Yet, 2017 was the best year for the global economy since 2010. Unemployment in the U.S. has plunged to 4.1 percent, and Wall Street hit another record high today. It's an astonishing 62 times it did that last year. And last night, the Washington Post tried to cover for all those horrible predictions by arguing in part that the global markets are just ignoring Trump. Wait a second. You got to be kidding me. As the Post points out, the U.S. accounts for one quarter of the world's $80 trillion economy. If Trump had truly been that wrecking ball that all the experts predicted, there would have been a seismic, sh seismic shock in all of the global uh, marketplace. And if you're wondering how Krugman won a Nobel, well, just remember, so did uh, President Obama and uh, Al Gore and Yasser Arafat. We'll be right back. Before we go, a few observations about Generation Snowflake. Now, look, I'm not going to claim that I walked to school uphill 10 miles each way in a blizzard. No, I didn't.